figure out how you want to live and then build a life around that. And, um, and that should be guided by what you're passionate about. And what I mean by that is if you've done some traveling and you know that in your heart you love being in the mountains or you love being by the beach or you love being in a city, figure out how to get to that place. Because when you wake up every day and you're in that place, that you are already one step ahead of the game. Welcome to Making It with Terry Woolman, the show that explores the secrets, successes, and strategies for making it in the music biz. And now, here's your host, Terry Woolman. Welcome to Making It with me, your host, Terry Wallman. I really appreciate you joining us every week on this show. It's um, It makes it more special for uh, my guest and for all of us at the station uh, to share these stories with you. And, and we know that you're listening and we get your your feedback and your, your emails and your Facebook posts. So, so thanks for your support on that. By the way, you can find all of our episodes at entertalkradio.com slash making it. You can also hear us on iTunes, Spotify, YouTube, and pretty much anywhere that you can find good conversation. There's a chance we're going to be streaming on on that website as well. So, um, you know, you can hear us in the car or at home. I created this show to focus on what it takes to have a lasting career in the ever-changing landscape of the entertainment business. And typically, I focus on music because I'm a musician, but... I this show is so much more about um, art and the creative process and and the an artist path than and what it takes to be successful in any of the elements of the entertainment business and the art world and that's why I'm shifting gears this this week uh, with a very special guest that I had the opportunity to meet in Ojai, California um, in January and. Uh, and so we're going to focus this show and this conversation on the visual arts and um, and what it takes to really be um, – to, to have a – to make a living in that world and, and, and really what that's all about. So let me start off by telling you about our guest. Lisa Cassoni has a sales and marketing background working for such companies as Giorgio Armani, Prada, and Caldwell Banker. In 2005, she became the communications and marketing manager for Claims Resource Services in Campbell, California. Lisa moved to Ojai, California in 2010, and in 2013, she co-created the Ojai Art Festival. Later that year, with Heather Stobo, she took over management of the Porch Gallery located in a historic building in downtown Ojai. In 2015, the couple founded Porch Girls Productions to represent emerging and established artists and produce artistic events throughout the Ojai Valley. Please welcome my guest today, Lisa Cassoni. Hi, Lisa. Hi, Terry. Nice to be with you. My pleasure to have you. And, uh, you know, I want um, everybody to know, first of all, if you ever make it to Ojai, this is a a must-see for you is to stop off at the Porch Gallery. Um, I feel like you're sort of the epicenter of, of town, you know, like literally, you know, geographically, but also just energetically. Um, when, when I had the opportunity to come by and, and see your, uh, your place, it kind of feels like, like your home. Uh, but it seemed like sort of a, a, a stopping point for everybody in town, you know, on the way to the farmer's market or to breakfast or lunch, or it, it's, it seems like a very social, um, gathering and a, a big part of the community there. Is that accurate? I would say that, that it is <laughs> and that um, we, from the very beginning, made an effort to put that out there and to create that uh, from the day we opened and took over management of the building. And the building itself is from the 1870s. So it's um, one of the oldest buildings in Ojai. So it's very familiar to people in Ojai and very, very uh, much about the downtown vibe, which right off the main street. So yes, I would say that's true. You know, I read on your website, I'll just read a quote. It says a relaxed place where art and community meet 
No visit to Ohio is complete without a visit to Porch Gallery. I especially love Sunday mornings on the porch after a quick stop at the farmer's market next door, listening to the piano, talking about art and life, watching the day unfold. That's um, a quote from um, Osceola Revitoff. Um, and it seems to really describe what you've created and um, and really drew me to wanting to have this conversation with you. Uh, so let's talk a little bit about you and your upbringing and, and how you ended up, you know, moving from the East Coast and ending in L.A. into this really um, beautiful artist community that you live in now that you and your partner are so much a part of. Tell me about your, your early years. Well, I was born in Philadelphia, and um, I, my grandparents were um, from from Philadelphia and emigrated to Philadelphia, and both my parents were born in um, Philadelphia, and so um, growing up there, uh, I was really part of a little town within the Northeast where everybody had kids at the same time, and we all played at the same places and played stickball and at night. And there was a fort down the street where we were able to create our own, uh, imaginative worlds. And we just were told, you know, come back, come back home for dinner. And, um, but we played all day long and it was a really enjoyable, um, experience, uh, growing up in, in Philadelphia. But then when I was 13, we moved to the center of the state, which is Harrisburg, the state capital. And, um, we moved into this really big house that, um, that sort of come back around to why I really enjoy where I'm at right now. But my parents bought this really big house and we're not a big family. There's only th- uh, three of us kids, but my dad fell in love with this, um, this building that was about a block from the, the Susquehanna river. And it had this really cool history to it. It had 21 rooms in it, seven rooms on each floor. And me and my brothers just thought it was just like a wonderland. <laughs> I mean, we were so overwhelmed by the size. That sounds of the- amazing. Yeah. And it had this really cool uh, dumb waiter that we, you could actually jump in. It was big and go from floor to floor. So my brothers and I would run down on this dumb waiter up and down the three floors to the basement. And then the basement had seven rooms and this giant ballroom. Cause it used to be a dance, um, a, like a dance class uh, room down there. But so our imaginations just went crazy in that house. And, um, so from there we, we moved out to the country and, um, we only stayed in that house about three years, and it just was, I think, just too overwhelming for my parents. But they really <laughs> right. enjoyed it, too, because my mom's from a big family, and those um, relatives and cousins would all come up, and uncles would help work on the house. And um, so it was really kind of cool that um, the whole family got to experience it, and my grandparents as well. And then um, we moved out to the country, and I hated it. I, w- I couldn't even <laughs> sleep for the first year. because It was too quiet? Any- any sound it was way too quiet and the only right. thing that kept me um, what I focused on just to get me to sleep was this really um, in the distant train that I would just focus on that sound because otherwise it was just too quiet so um, so me and my my older brother we just couldn't stand it when we first moved there because it just was so far out from everything and so until he got his uh, driver's license and I was a year behind him we were kind of stuck out in this place with um, not much going on. But luckily, uh, my brothers and I were really into um, outdoor activities. We um, There was a creek bed, so we would go down there, and there were tennis courts. And we could go river rafting right by the uh, tennis courts. There was a That's little fantastic. small college. Yeah, right. there was a little small college called Messiah College that was um, about a mile away. So we would um, – our my mom would take us down. We'd have these like river rafts and then we would just raft down this little river um, during the day just to have things to do. And then there was a tennis court there. So we played tennis. And then my brothers and I, we were really active outdoor, um, played all kinds of sports and we were always outside. So that's how we got to meet some of the neighbor kids and stay, um, stay active. And so I ended up um, going through high school in this uh, small town. <laughs> And then when I was about 17, I told my dad, I said, I can't stand being a small town anymore, dad. So he convinced me um, to stay one more year and work, uh, and which I did. And then I moved to Washington, D.C., and I lived in Washington, D.C. for seven years and really enjoyed every single part of living in that city. I, I lived in an area called Cleveland Park, which mm-hmm. was right by the zoo, the Washington Zoo. 
and um, I could just jump on um, trans- public transportation. It was really close to Georgetown and this funky little area called Adams Morgan, which was like the next metro stop down. And I just loved everything about it. I loved all the culture. I loved going to museums. I, I just thought it was just the coolest experience. And so I was there for seven and years. Did you move there with a job or did you have friends or family or do you, you just showed up? I had a friend there. And so th- okay. I think that was one of the reasons my parents were okay with me moving there um, at 17. And that's what's so cool about listening to so many other people's stories about their upbringing is like, it only takes one friend to even, I didn't even know her that well, but I was like, right. I, I was not a person to want to be in a small town early on. Mm-hmm. And um, I just, I just think my curiosity was just way too big for staying in a small town. And right. So, yeah, so I lived there and, and like I said, enjoyed every minute of it for seven years. And, um, and then, uh, what happened was my older brother, uh, got a job, uh, and no, actually he, he went to school out here in California, uh, to get his master's and he, I came for a visit to visit him in California. And one of the things, uh, when I was a kid, my parents used to take us to a lot of different States on, on time off. And so we traveled on, um, in the summer and, but we never made it to California. So me and my brothers were always like miss, like this was this mystical, mysterious place that we always wanted mm-hmm. to get. And the furthest we got was Colorado. Cause we had an uncle that lived in Colorado, but we never made it as far as California. We, none of us knew anybody in California, but my dad had come out on business a couple of times and he just raved about how beautiful it was. So that was a memory that I was always like embedded in me. Like someday I'm going to get to California and, Right. I thought it was going to be a visit, um, not to actually have an opportunity to move. So um, within a year, I visited my older brother, and I was just blown away by the beauty of California, that within a day you can be in the mountains or driving up the coast, and he just loved it too. So I um, I got out here within a year to California um, of him being out here, and then subsequent to that, my younger brother moved out. And so we were all out in California. So that was really fun. But the the funny part about this um, California, the beginning of it is they gravitated towards the northern part of the state. Uh They, I think, instinctively thought I would like the north better, too, because of just San Francisco being a lot like some East Coast towns that we had experienced. Mm -hmm. And I was of the opinion that if I'm going to move 3000 miles, I want to be in sunny weather. (laughs) Right. <laughs> warm and sunny. I don't want to be in cold weather. So, so we always had this like very funny um, exchange all the time that, you know, Southern Cal is better than Northern Cal. And so, um, so anyway, yeah, there's, so there's, uh, they've, um, have run a, a, a business for many, many years in Northern California. So, but I've always been in Southern California until moving to Ojai, um, back about nine years ago. So, so let's <laughs> tell me, we, you know, when you moved to LA, how do you land uh, doing sales and marketing for Giorgio Armani and Prada? And <laughs> and how does that lead you to becoming a co-creator of not only the Ojai Art Festival, but along with your partner, Heather, you know, running a, a, this wonderful gallery, an art gallery? Well, I think my journey, I can only kind of speak from my journey, but I – I like to, I've been thinking about this, you know, over the last couple of years, um, pretty deeply, but I think the, there were three major things I did in LA for the 20 years that I, I was there. So for the first several years, I sold uh, real estate for Coldwell Banker. Mm-hmm. And then from there, I moved into working for Giorgio Armani and the Prada, um, uh, store in Beverly Hills. And then after that, I worked for my brother's company doing uh, sales and marketing. But going back to the the first ring of that, um, each one of those helped me develop skill sets that I use every day now. And they seem very disparate and they seem like they wouldn't come into play. But the the tools and techniques and um, ways that I was interacting with people in each one of these fields really has served me now in the most interesting of ways. Like, for example... With real estate, you have to have a lot of patience. You Mm -hmm. have to um, deal with all different kinds of uh, 
structures and with the way people interact with their homes. And it's very, it's very psychological. It's very emotional. I was right. really young when I moved to California. I was in my early twenties and it's a really hard thing. I think for a younger person to get into, unless, unless your family was in the business, because mm-hmm. there's a lot of things you pick up, um, just, uh, being in a family business with real estate. And I didn't know the first thing about it. I was just really enamored by the, the way different neighborhoods laid out in, in California. And so when I gravitated to California and to Southern California, I initially lived in um, the Hollywood area. And then I moved, uh, I lived in basically three different neighborhoods when I was in California, uh, Southern California, that is. One was in Hollywood when I first moved to um, to uh, California was Hollywood. And then- That's I where lived- I started to, yeah, little studio apartment in Hollywood. <laughs> yeah, exactly. And so- <laughs> um, we did. Yeah, so I, I I I was really enamored, like I said, by um, the the different types of neighborhoods within and how close they all were. And like from how I, you didn't you don't see this when you're you know seeing it from a distance, but they're all really kind of interconnected and close. You have Hollywood next to West Hollywood, next to right next to Beverly Hills, and then you have mm-hmm. the Hollywood Hills, and all of those areas are so unique and interesting. And I found that to be really fun um, to mm-hmm. be able to go and be part of that. And so, you know, you, you learn very quickly uh, on the job, um, what the, what the, you know, the ups and downs, the language, the ins and outs of that are, but I found it extremely difficult, um, for someone very young, uh, because it's, it is a field where experience really matters. Um, and to not have grown up there and not to have really any social or, um, connections or business connections, it was very difficult for me. And then, um, the other thing, yeah. The other thing that um, that happened is I moved with a partner and um, we tried to buy a house uh, about the third year that I was in the business. And the deal totally fell through right before the close of the sale. And I was really frustrated and I was extremely upset. And we it had nothing to do with anything that we did. I mean, we did okay. everything we were supposed to do. And essentially, the person just wanted to back out because they thought they should have gotten more money for the house. So it was highly a highly frustrating um, experience to be around. And so after four years, I made a, a determination that it really wasn't in my in my. But did, I didn't find it as interesting. I didn't find oh, it as okay. fun, and um, I found it incredibly uh, m- uh, much more of a struggle than it was um, that I was succeeding on a lot of levels that I wanted to succeed with it. So that's how I found um, the, the whole idea of uh, working for really high-end retail, meaning Armani and, and Prada. And mm-hmm. the, the one thing I want to say about that, um, being in that field, is you, you're interacting with um, people every day who, of, of means uh, because, you know, these are this is not the gap or um, – uh, it's, it's a whole other – Right. It's a very high-quality product that yeah. with a price tag that matches it. Exactly. And so um, you it, it, this is where it really it came into play with what I do now. You build relationships with people because they they come in and um, you get to know them on a personal level. And I have to say, specifically, the, the working at Prada was so interesting to me because the way we all were hired, it was almost as if we all had different personalities. We all brought something different to it, but collectively, because we all worked together, nobody was on individual commissions. We all worked together um, Mm. to make this place and make this um, environment really just, just sing and do really well. And so um, the person that owned it actually owned it as a franchise and nobody else sold it in town. So she got it early on and the people just lined up to come in that store and Mm -hmm. to see the product and see what the merchandise looked like from season to season. And so it was really fun. And so she called us her girls. And so (laughs) we were treated so well because we were doing so well and um, we, we, we couldn't even keep the product in um, long enough. I mean, it just, as soon as it came in, it was going out and we all, all of those girls um, over 25 years later, we still stay connected. Uh, so we get together usually once or twice a year. We all follow each other's um, lives and families. And um, the person who's sort of the ringleader, who was our um, who was our um, manager, she did that. She kept us together. She stayed in touch with all of us. And even if some of us moved away or are not in LA anymore, uh, people fly back uh, to get together. Uh, and it's mm-hmm. a really it was, it was such a really good group of people. That's and, so great to hear. Yeah. Yeah. So that really. 
I think um, had an impact on me too, how to work together, how to work with the team, how to work with uh, people who of, um, that have high expectations of your service level and of you know coming through and following through and keeping track of um, all kinds of uh, seasonal changes. And, and that's the other cool thing about it that I, I sort of take with me now is every season, so we have four seasons of different um, different clothing and shoes and accessories. So it changes often. It's not stagnant. So there's constant movement with it. And I, and I really enjoyed that. I enjoyed the change, uh, that it was, um, not the same old, same old every day. So what and made then, you think, Oh, go ahead, yeah. Lisa. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Go ahead. Well, I was, I was just wondering, so I, I, I know that you moved to Ojai because y- you know, you didn't want to live in LA anymore by the time you turned 50, you know? And right. so there was a, you, you know, there's personal sort of energetic, life goals and, you know, things that you wanted to do, um, that were important to you. And and I commend you for, you know, speaking that with clarity and, and, and you and Heather made that happen. What, um, you know, I know that Heather, uh, Stobo, who is your partner has a BA in art history and a BFA in photography and, and then went and got an MFA in photography also. Um, so she's got a very strong art background and, and you've got a very strong marketing sales background and people background. What possessed you to, to open an art gallery? <laughs> so I think that we, um, the first step to that was Heather had a show in Ojai at a different location. Mm-hmm. And that location is not an art gallery anymore, but both brought us to uh, a really interesting and vibrant experience because Ojai is a very interesting art town. So the yes. experience of having that show um, with Heather really sort of clicked in to uh, our skill sets too and what, how we could make something that could be really uh, interesting and, and was already set up in a way that our skill sets – put us in a really good position. So that was at a different location. So we knew the owner of the building that we ended up having um, bought, uh, purchased and it was the porch gallery. And we actually changed the name to the porch gallery. It was actually at the time called the main gallery, which was a combination mm-hmm. of two people's names. But we called up the owner of it, of the, of the gallery and started a conversation with him. And because of uh, these circumstances that were in our favor at the time, we were able to take over management fairly quickly uh, and really took that ball and ran with it um, after mm-hmm. a, a conversation with um, the owner of the building and of the gallery. And so right off the bat, immediately we started working on bringing community and um, and others into the fold of what we were trying to do here. And when I say others, I mean connecting with other institutions, with other people doing other artful endeavors. And so it wasn't always just about the visual arts here. It was about really connecting in the community in in a lot of other interesting ways and with uh, interesting people that are, are here and have been here much longer than us. And also we took what the building gave us. This, this building has a beautiful wraparound porch. And that's why we changed the name to the porch gallery because it's what the building was telling us. It was speaking to us in that way. Right, it has right. Way you walk up to it, and it has these columns, and it has this presence to it. And so, we were just no. I was just noticing that a lot. And when people would walk by and look up and see it, and the farmers market's literally a half a block from here. So we started connecting all those dots and started inviting people to come on Sunday mornings. And I think to, that was a, a great. Um, head scratcher for Heather when I started really promoting this and engaging with this because she came from an art world background where, you know, you walk into a gallery and it's just a certain way. I mean, right. It's, it's not what she expected. I think at all. (laughs) (laughs) Well, it's a home, you know, that's, that's what's so intriguing about it. You walk in, you walk up to the porch and you already feel like you're home. Yeah, that was that was our feeling when we visited. And but the other thing is, in addition to the porch, you've got this amazing old kitchen and you you let you let the kitchen speak to you as well, because, you know, you're the only art gallery that that I've ever been in that that actually cooks chocolates. 
I mean, you've got you've got a chocolate factory in there, <laughs> you know, for for better chocolates, it, which I want <laughs> I want you to tell everybody about your inspiration, you know, with Beatrice Wood, the the mama of Dada art and how that turned into you also, you know, providing um, not only like, you know, coffee and, and, you know, juice or what, you know, when you walk through the front porch, but you walk in and you're exposed to this beautiful art. There's a piano there. Um, it's a complete artistic experience. And then you smell this chocolate coming from the kitchen that is intoxicating and delicious. Well, that's really a, I already sort of imagined what you just said. And it's so cool to like think about walking through that way. And, and I really enjoy that when people um, experience it that way. But so Beto chocolates. So Beto chocolates um, came about, by the way, Beto is, was Beatrice and Wood's nickname. So people that knew her or um, couldn't pronounce her name uh, called her Beto. And so it was an endearing uh, moniker for her. And so we knew a lot about Beatrice Wood before moving to Ojai. We knew that she was um, helped start one of the, few women to help start an art movement called the Dada movement. We knew that there was a Beatrice Wood Center for the Arts here. We knew a lot about her even coming into Ojai because she was such a significant art presence and um, being a woman of just a really interesting life that she created for herself and people that she knew and the people that came out to see her, where she traveled, the books she wrote, just one of the most interesting women in the arts. So what happened with us was we were um, evacuated from the Thomas fire with a third mm. woman who became our partner in the Beto chocolate endeavor. So when we evacuated um, for the fire, we went um, and we're away for about four or five days. And it was very stressful because we didn't know when we were away, having seen some of the some of the video that was coming through that the town was really almost like a, they call it the donut. It was surrounded by fire and we mm. were uh, stressed, you know, beyond belief because we had just um, made uh, the first um, effort to buy the building and our home was a couple blocks from here. So it's just these two stressful situations going on simultaneously, but this place where we evacuated every day they would serve this chocolate and it was so comforting to me. Chocolate's sort of a comfort food for me. So, Having um, having long conversations about potential legacy losses in Ojai, because it's such an amazing town in, in so many levels, of course, we gravitated towards an art person who was probably the most famous artist to come out of Ojai. And the thought of her, her uh, legacy, her building, her structure, her um, studio that was left intact being gone was really s sad to us and, and quite upsetting. Yeah. So, so quickly... Um, the conversation started talking about staying creative instead of staying in the negative. So we started talking about if we came back and everything survived, that we would do something with the chocolate and Beto because we, it, this wasn't something that we just made up. She had this real love of chocolate art and young men uh, and uh, not, <laughs> not necessarily in that order. And right. People, and people knew to bring her chocolate. So um, <laughs> when we got back and um, she was course, a connoisseur of fine things in life. <laughs> that, that is so true. She actually wrote <laughs> an autobiography called I Shock Myself, which if um, <laughs> if, if you're if your uh, listeners have never heard of it, it's such a great read and um, really inspiring. So when we got back um, and we knew you know, we had this kitchen in the building and um, everything went through with purchasing the building uh, that. Um, we wanted to do something that was inspirational and not negative. And that's, that came out of something like the Dada's they, they sort of rejected logic and reason anyway, with the way they looked at what art could be. And so we started doing that. We started saying, okay, let's not stay in the negative of what we just went through because it was pretty quiet for a number of months here. Um, after the fire, we said, what, you know, what can we do that um, could keep our creative juices going? So the, the chocolate idea really hatched when we went up to talk to the head of the Beatrice Wood Center, whose name is Kevin Wallace. And we told him our idea. And he actually really thought it was a really great idea. And so from there, we um, we started, and he actually uh, had us look at some of Beto's molds, her actual molds that she made uh, her artwork from. And so the first mold, that uh, the chocolate mold that we came out with is called the Moon Face, which is actually a piece of her art, which is so fantastic. So Yeah, that's wonderful. Um, so that's kind of where we're the, the inspiration and the, the the starting off point of um, the chocolate business and and having it's not just that we have the, you know able the ability to make the chocolate at, in the gallery and uh, within the, the building and the having the, the the kitchen to do this 
we wanted to actually have a room in that house, in this house that we called the Beto Lounge, where you could come in and you could sit on a really nice uh, set of tab- uh, chairs or couch and read about her and see what she was about. We have some of her glazes and plates and some of her pieces in the room. And so you can really understand who she was and feel very comfortable in that room and also sample chocolate and buy chocolate there. So we didn't want us just to be like, okay, we'll have a couple boxes of chocolate out. We wanted to create an experience within the building and within the room um, that's designated to, um, to that inspiration. And, you know, the other cool thing was um, with the data is rejecting logic and reason. We, we said to ourselves, like, sometimes destruction is not the end of creativity. It's the beginning. So we had all this right. destruction around us, you know, up in the hills yeah. and loss. And we said, okay, what can we do with that? That's not the end, but the beginning. So that's where that started. And um, I have to say, there's one other really important part to this. The person that we evacuated with who became our third partner, this is one thing I really share a lot with, with others is that when you bring in partners, cause Heather and I've been partners for a really long time in this business and, so we, when we brought in um, Emily Burst, and, and also, by the way, let me interject. So you and Heather are partners, but you you are also life partners. You're, that's correct. You're, so you're in a relate a personal relationship as well yeah. as a business relationship. Just to clarify. Sure, sure. So um, that's that's so true. Almost twenty years. <laughs> yeah, which is fantastic, and it's also part of the tapestry of of both of your your stories. I agree. Yeah. I agree. Yeah. So, so um, your so, third partner, the third partner. So we happened to have been evacuated with her and we didn't know Emily all that well when we evacuated with her. But, you know, when you're with somebody for five days straight and you're going through a very stressful scenario with your um, mm-hmm. with the fire, you get to know each other fairly quickly. And um, so she, she actually had this great food service background with her uh, a business that she started years ago in L.A. But she bought a home in Ojai and she said, you know, I can help you guys with a lot of the startup and the structure of this and the equipment of this. And Emily ended up becoming our chocolatier. So <laughs> she, this was what's so much fun is that she, all her skill sets brought to bear as well as what Heather and I could bring to it to make it a, right away um, a, an entity that people were drawn to and that looked good and that that is working well and that we're, there's a lot of crea- creativity that we're working through this year already. So we just set ourselves up with this third person who's gone through this journey with us too, which is really one of the greatest things I, I have to talk about is like who you go through things with. And so this has been right. just a really right. fantastic um, new experience here within the gallery uh, besides, you know, running the, the other core business, which is our, which is our art gallery. So you, you, what comes through, um, in this conversation to me and what I feel from you is your deep sense of passion and commitment uh, on, on many levels, you know, but really to um, certainly keep the, the work of artists like, like Beatrice Wood alive, you know, and, you know, I mean, I know that that has become part of your life mission um, for that one particular artist, but also to, uh, to expose new artists to um, your community and to support them. And, you know, it, there's, it, it feels like you are living the, the life of an artist yourself and in, in creatively. In other words, your, your creative process and the passion that you bring to it is, is exactly the same as what I bring to mine in being a, a music artist and, and, you know, creating albums and, and producing other artists and, and, just wanting to support art in general. So I guess that leads me to my question. Like why is art so important to um, preserve and to support and create and share and nurture? Well, I think um, that's such a great question, by the way. And I think it is because I think in the truest sense, whatever, whatever type of art you're involved with, if speaks to people on its truest, on our truest human levels. And so whether you're listening to or follow the most beautiful art forms, whether it's music or visual art or performing art, it's our, it's us at our best when we're creating and when we do it with passion and we do it with um, thought and we do it with putting the work in and we do it with um, creativity and uh, just, 
figuring out and problem solving. I think most people don't understand how much problem solving artists do. And I find that so fascinating. And I don't think they give themselves enough credit for that because they're always problem solving. They're always looking at a piece and saying, how do I fix it? How do I make it better? How do I make it better? Yeah. How do I, how do I make it better? How do I make this all cohesive? And that's one of the great things about um, working with artists and also living with an artist. And, and Heather, um, like you mentioned before, comes from an art background. And those are the questions that are constantly being asked and, and um, having to be answered in, in the purest in sense, if you really want to make a life out of this and a living out of it, because it's hard. It's not um, an easy path. And most things aren't easy anymore. And most things are highly competitive now, as, as is the right. art. Uh, but you have to bring that to bear. And so even myself, who I never thought of myself, like you said, as a creative person, there is a creativity to working and promoting and positioning what you want to do with your business and with artists. That's very uh, important to understand where they're coming from and what they want to put out there and how they want to do it and when they want to do it. And so that's that's a really big discussion that others can help them with people like myself who come from a sales background and a marketing background that see it from a bigger point of view, not just a, well, I have to sell so much this year or this season or this body of work. I just don't think that way. I think of it as a true life journey. And so you, the process is just so important. So that's why we show a lot of artists that aren't necessarily the newest artist out or the ones just out of school. There's great work being done by more mature artists or mid-career artists because they've just lived life more. They've seen more, they've experienced more. And so that's a big deal for us. We really look at that whole environment of what the artist is thinking about and going through. And it has to mean something to us because if it doesn't mean something to them, then how's it going to mean something to us when we're trying to, to promote a show or be in a show for six weeks at a time with, with that journey. And again, with, I have to say this because it really does hold true. It's not just that one time that we work with the artist and then it's done. We develop over time uh, with collectors and with interested people coming in to um, visit what we're doing. Oftentimes it doesn't sell during the show. It sells later because someone has to think about it and be with it. And then mm -hmm. they call right. us up. It's like, God, I really like that work. Is it still there or is there more work available? And so that's a lot, that's a lifelong discussion. And then you get into that. It's really fun because it's just, um, it evolves is really what it does. It evolves. And so I, every day I wake up and I'm thinking about those things and, uh, it's really fun because it changes and it evolves and it develops and just like what you do, it's not, it's not stagnant. And the other cool thing right. about the art world too, is you don't necessarily know the outcome. So like sports, when we you know really get into um, a sports team or watching sports, you don't. Most of the time, I think people like it because they don't know the outcome. Right. Oh, exactly. Yeah. <laughs> the, the, the and you know it gets back to what you brought up earlier that you were a curious child. Very. And I was too. Um, you know, and you're like in a small community. It's certainly not. Um, the sticks, you know, or backwards culturally, although it's, you know, you're in the woods and the mountains and, and it sort of has the best of, of both worlds in that. But how do you stay connected uh, nationally and internationally to the art scene? Is that important to you? Like, do you, do you go to Miami to go to Art Basel, you know, to the, to the big international shows? Does, does that hold your interest? Um, you know, what's, or do you feel, do you feel, sort of you, you just stay in your own lane. What's your, your global perspective on how you uh, maneuver through the art world? Uh, another really good question. So not, we have never thought just um, ourselves as local uh, and how you stay connected to that is um, well, the, the first way is you read a lot. You, you read a lot of what's happening in the art world. There's many publications, there's many online services that you can um, stay connected to. And we're on an um, international platform where we can put art of, from our shows up on it and artists from and collectors from all over the world can go on it daily. We uh, go to a lot of art um, 
art openings, art shows, art fairs. Um, there's right now there's a number of them coming up in LA that are important. So you have to, you got to get out of your town too, no matter what town you're in and see these shows, uh, be involved in these fairs, whether you're par- participating as, um, a, you know, having a booth or not, but you're among, again, you're, again, you're among your colleagues and you're among mm-hmm. other, other people, other, um, museum people and gallery people. And everybody starts, you know, just like any other business, it's, it's a relatively small world. You start knowing each other. You, it's, people are very open to, um, contacting and communicating and asking questions and we all stay connected. Um, I think the other important thing is to, uh, talk to art writers and follow art writers and uh, talk, you know, have them up and in, invite them up and uh, stay connected with them and what they're doing and comment on what they're doing. And so I think it's it's an active sport. You have to not just um, expect everything to come to you. You have to participate. You have to go support others and what they're doing and their shows and their openings and their it's, it's um, you can't expect anybody to come to you if you're not, you know, a, in it and a part of it. Yeah, that makes sense. Yep. I'm also wondering right now and listening to you speak um, ab- about how how does, from your perspective, how does an artist put a price, like put, how do you put a price on talent or time, you know, when you are uh, a visual artist and, and also not just the artist, but um, you as a curator, you know, you as somebody who is in a business of keeping a, an art gallery open where there's no cover charge to come into the gallery, you know? So, you know, what's your, what's your philosophy on putting a price on talent? I think that when you're really starting to talk to people about decisions, about showing them at your own space, there's sort of a holistic way to think about it and come at it. That is is, a lot of people think that it's, you know, just, slapped on there and you know how, how can you put such a price on something but it really is there's a, a journey with all of this like when you come out of school or even if you're uh, self-taught you don't get into good galleries right away you might get into some group shows or some maybe a coffee shop that's uh, in your neighborhood or depending on where you live um regional uh, mus- um, galleries and that that stems from putting bodies of work together that resonate and have quality that you've honed your skills with. And if you're the public reacts to it, collectors react to it and start buying it. They, they don't buy it for high prices. When you first start you, when you start selling, that's when you can start asking for more money for your next body of work. And then if that body of work is selling, then you can, up your prices again. So it is a sort of a stepping stone of working through sales based on your history of work and the, the quality of work that you're putting out and also who you want to get it in front of. And so I think that, um, lots of young artists, that's why they go to openings, they go to galleries, they get themselves in front of gallerists and curators, they're being seen, they're um, asking to send packets to look at of their work, describing what it is their new bodies of work are, telling the curators and the gallerists what they're selling and what's selling and who's buying it. So that's those are constant conversations. And it's, it's a build. It doesn't just stop and start with, oh, I think I want to put this price on my pieces. Um, so I hope that that clarifies it a little bit, but um, it does. It, yeah. it, is, it is a little bit of a mystery, but there, there really isn't that much of a mystery if you think about <laughs> it. <laughs> that. Um, yeah, you start out and you start getting it, your work sold and then you put uh, another price on the next body of work. And then hopefully people are responding to that. And again, but you have to put the work in. You have to, you know. Right. Know, yeah. Know the, what, it really comes what, down to the work at the end of, of the day, the the art, the, you know, the quality, the the focus, intention, commitment. Exactly. It's, really and about the, it's about the art. Exactly. And then in terms of like gallerists and how they choose and what they choose, you know, some gallerists, they, um, which I really admire, it's not what we do, but they, they specialize in certain types of art, like video art or, um, 
outsider art and that's all they show. And they're, that's what they're passionate about. And they really focus on that. And they go to the fairs where the, the art outsider art fairs are. And that's really interesting to me that uh, the people that really super focus on one type of artist for us, I think it's just my curiosity is to, um, too strong with lots of different type of art that we show from visual art to sculpture to, um, I mean, I think we just have a curiosity of, of a broader sense of what interests us versus being very specific. So you have to know your personality too, what you enjoy looking at. And, um, and that comes from looking at a lot of work. You have to go and see a lot of things, both regionally, nationally, go to great museums around the country and around the world. And then you start honing what it is you like and what you want to see when you get an opportunity to do it. I want to uh, let all of our listeners know, by the way, right now, that if people want to know more about Porch Gallery, they can go to porchgalleryohi.com. And uh, that's correct, right? And and people can find out really more about all of the shows that you do. Uh, about the history of of the actual house uh, and the community and your chocolates and wine tastings and which by the way you you also host um, basically sort of soirees is it every six weeks? Well, our shows average uh, about six weeks the length of them and um, there are many ways that we uh, come at the show, both from the beginning of the show, the middle of the show and the end of the show. So yes, we do host um, openings that are a little more uh, involved where sometimes we'll bring in a mixologist or create a drink <laughs> around the theme of a show. Right. Or, and that's where sort of Porch Girls Productions came about because we wanted to take the, the, what the town also is so creative. There's so many great musicians in town, people doing great things with interesting food and the farmers here, they're growing amazing things. So Sometimes we take it off site and sometimes we'll go to another venue and bring in music and food and, of course, the artist and have an artist talk and a podcast around um, uh, structuring podcast around artists when they um, they come up and show here. So the town really does open itself up to that because we're I think it's one of the coolest small towns that doesn't have a small mind. It's a big heart, Mm. a big mind. People are very curious. Yeah, it's one of the things I loved about Ojai. Small town, but not small-minded at all. Right, yeah. And, you know, even your the your concert scene, you know, you you bring in some really wonderful artists from around the country to come and, and perform. And it's, uh, and and you certainly have your, your fair amount of um, really highly esteemed artists that live in your community already. You know, visual artists, musicians, dancers, actors, so there's, you know, it's, it almost has a little bit of a, you know, a, an creative energy, energetic buzz like New York does or Berlin, you know, there's, it's an artist town. It feels like, you know, all, and it's also a farmer town, you know, it's a growers town, you know, with, with wineries and, and, you know, it's, there's a lot of um, life <laughs> happening in Ojai. You know, on on all levels. Yeah, I actually I, I um, coined this phrase about Ojai when I first got here. I call I call it Ojai, the town with nothing to do and not enough time to do it. <laughs> That's great. I can see that. <laughs> Which is kind of a joke because for for me because I have never been busier than I ever have um, the, in the time that I've been here. And there are so many things you can tap into here on any given weekend. There's so many people doing really interesting creative things here that you could be busy every weekend if you wanted to, or you could be in your studio, you know, um, creating and having quiet. And it, it is, there is a peaceful, really spiritual quality to this town that I think attracts those like-minded people. But the thing that you said about, you know, it being an agricultural town and, um, you know, creative town, those are the things I think that make it so special because the other thing that it's known for are these great schools. So you have this, it's not just one thing. It's, it's a number of things that really hold it up and in high in high esteem. And those things have been here for many, many years. It's not just um, that they just you know sprouted up the last couple of years. And, and we enjoy all of that about the town. And all of these schools here, they do great programs. Uh, they, these, these students coming out of these schools, I mean, we, uh, often we use um, 
over the last couple of years, there have been students who have been our interns and they are just amazing students and amazing kids what they're doing already. And um, growing up in Ojai and the experiences they've had here are very unique. And um, I think they're really turning these young people into, you know, just great citizens of the world when they leave here. So I really appreciate that about um, Ojai as well. And do you feel that is part of your responsibility to mentor and, and be involved in art education? I would imagine the answer is yes. Yes. I think it's really important having these schools, both public and private here. And um, again, the community is, Oh, is probably less than 8,000 people, but the Valley is um, much bigger. And so spreading out to the Valley and encouraging students from all the different schools to come in here for different shows has been one of the things I've, I thought was very, very important from the very beginning and exposing them to, um, contemporary art. So Ojai is known uh, primarily, I think, for spiritual art and craft art. So that was one of the things that we were focused on with what we liked, which was contemporary art. So oftentimes I say to young students too, find what's not there and do it really well. And then, then you can, people will find you, they will experience you, they will follow you. But, um, That's really served us well, too, is working with uh, the young community, the young uh, students. And there are many students here that are very interested in the arts. So we we find that um, to be a big responsibility to share with them as well. Well, I thank you for for doing that. I think it's so important. And that's that's sort of the essence of this show. Not even sort of. That is the essence of this radio show as well. It's it's mentoring. You know, it's 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 showing how to. And what's involved and, and why and what's important, you know, not not just in the actual artistic endeavor, but in having a, a great life. And that leads me to my closing questions. We've got about six minutes left to the show. Um, so I want to start with a two part question that I ask all of my guests. Since this show is called Making It, what does making it mean to you both personally and professionally? OK, uh, that's a good question. Well, um, <laughs> I think personally, I think what's been great for me is that um, I, I get to wake up every day in this town that I really do love living in. And it's surrounded by these beautiful orange groves and they're getting ready to bloom right now. So the whole town is filled with this beautiful, I think, like incredibly intoxicating smell. And I get to do that with my, you know, my wife of almost 20 years now. Mm-hmm. Um, I think the other part of that for me personally is that uh, having friends uh, both here that I've met since I've been here that have turned out to be really close friends and a community of just really interesting people that I get to spend time with and hike with and jump on my bike and share ideas with. I think that's um, really personally uh, something that I have really value. And um, and I think if, if I had to say professionally, I think I think – one of the things is like being recognized by your peers, uh, that you're doing sustained good work. I think that's important, uh, in, in, in any profession. Um, I think that the other part to that is that, uh, you're recognized by your community as well for being someone who's made contributions, uh, and done some positive things and impactful things in the community. And I think, um, the other thing for me just professionally is that we've been able to, um, purchase this building that is just one of the most interesting places and um, buildings in Ojai. It's uh, built in 1874. And we get to have businesses within this building that are really thriving and that people come to and seek out. And um, we get to live in the building as well. So it's all integrated. The whole thing is integrated. And um, that's why every day I wake up and I feel so grateful for all of that, for both the professional and personal part of it. There, there, that explains why there's such a strong sense of um, it being a personal experience and when you walk into the gallery. It does literally feel like you're home, and it also feels like it's it's so much a part of the community that you live in. So it's it's personal and it's broad at the same time. And by the way, I, I want to just acknowledge um, that the fact that you're married for 20 years and and having a successful career, you know, doing both i i applaud you and i appreciate um anybody who who understands the importance of balancing a personal life with a business life i just i think it's pretty wonderful you know so um kudos to you to you and heather for for having created this beautiful life together um 
I wanted to uh, also ask you, what are three tips that you can recommend for success uh, to our listeners? Three tips that have driven your career. Mm. I think one of the first things um, I could, I would honestly say is uh, travel early and often Uh, when you get out, when you get out to see the world. uh, And even if you're, you can only see surrounding states when you first start out. It really changes your perspective because we we don't have control over you know where we are born or where we grow up uh, for you know until we're in our early twenties or late teens when we can get out. So when you get out of your own environment and you really see what's out there, you can kind of develop what your own tastes are, and so that's really important. I think early on to to do that because. Um, that then allows you to figure out sort of what what directions you want to go in, what interests and um, ideas you want to put out there. So, I think travel I, early and often. Tra- travel early and often. I love um, that. Okay, another tip that um, that I would say is really important, especially be, being in an artistic uh, world, is adopt a dog. Um, <laughs> so far i'm i'm with you on on one and two i've done both and i agree (laughs) and if it's not a dog then a cat or a bird or you know a sugar glider any one of those um but (laughs) some some way of not um on on the hard days when uh because there are definitely ups and downs with it all that um you have this unconditional being in in your space that um that just will uh just keep you, keep you grounded. And they're just awesome to have as um, a rescue animal. So. And and the third tip, before I get to our final question, we've got about a minute and a half left in the show. So I got to move it along. <laughs> oh, okay. Um, I think the most important thing is really uh, in terms of a final tip is do what you're passionate about and really mm-hmm. um, hone that down as early as you can and develop that. That's great advice on all three. Um, and three of the best tips that I've, that I've heard on this show. Um, in our last minute, uh, at this point of your life with everything that you know to be true, what would you tell your younger self if you could? I would say that, um, figure out how you want to live and then build a life around that. And, um, and that should be guided by what you're passionate about. And what I mean by that is, if you've done some traveling and you know that in your heart you love being in the mountains or you love being by the beach or you love being in a city, figure out how to get to that place. Because when you wake up every day and you're in that place, that you are already one step ahead of the game because the struggles are going to come. It's going to get tough. But when you wake up and you know you love where you live um, and you're, you're in that environment that speaks to you. And that's why I'm in Ojai. I love getting up, getting on a bike, being around the mountains, not having to get in a car anymore. Everything is so much easier so that I can get more done when I get back to work. It made a huge difference. And I followed that. I followed that advice. And, um, sometimes, you know, that will change. Maybe you won't be in the city for a couple years or 20 years like I was. And then I don't want to be in a city anymore. But figure and on out that note, that I, I, I'm so sorry to cut you, but we, um, we're done. And I, I want to thank you for spending the hour with me. I really appreciate your time, Lisa, and all your wonderful advice. Everybody go check out the Porch Gallery in Ojai. And uh, thanks for joining us this week. And we'll see you next week. Thanks, Lisa. Thanks, sir. Tune in again next week for another great episode of Making It with Terry Wolf.